and some more. What is that? You don't recognize these? These are images from a local retirement community's art class. Russell, that's not what Dr. Lynn means by state-of-the-art imaging. Oh. She's talking about state-of-the-art imaging for the aging patient, not by the aging patient. Sorry. Dr. Lynn is an assistant professor of research at the UT Health Science Center's Cellular and Structural Biology Research Imaging Institute at the Barshop Institute. She received her postdoctoral training on cerebral metabolic physiology in 2009 at the UT Health Science Center, oh, I'm sorry, in, in San Antonio. She has expertise in cerebral hemodynamics and metabolism, digital imaging processing and analysis, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and understanding the physics for X-ray, CT, MRI, SPECT, PET, and ultrasound. Dr. Lynn is currently working on two federal grants the Strong Star Multidisciplinary PTSD Research Consortium and the NIA's Insular Autonomic Function in Depression Study. Please help us welcome Dr. Lynn. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really like to thank the organizer for having me here because uh, you may know <laughs> that actually I'm the replacement of Dr. Fox, actually. Okay, so um, I'm here presenting the uh, talk on behavior of Dr. Fox, and let me give you some uh, background of uh, uh, our uh, work together. So among his, uh, he's a well-known neurologist and neuroscientist, and he's also a well-known neuroimager. Among his lots of outstanding works, his well-known, I think is the most well-known work, is his discovery, the flow metabolism uncoupling. And this is published in PNS and Science in the, uh, uh, the 80s. And you can see the citation is more than a thousand. So, you know, these uh, this works are very popular. And what does that mean about flow metabolism coupling? So actually, you know, in the past century, neuroscientists always think that when the brain is firing, uh, the uh, neuron is firing, the blood flow and oxygen metabolism should go parallelly increase together. And because neuron firing needs oxygen and blood flow uh, supplies oxygen, so this two, uh, the increment should be parallel. But to his surprise, to Dr. Fox's surprise, using PET imaging, post emission tomography, you can see under uh, vis uh, visual stimulation, the blood flow increase is about 50% while oxygen metabolism only uh, increased 5%. So this so-called uncoupling, and this is really uh, a dramatic discovery because they really shift our understanding of uh, brain function um, uh, during any task. And this actually is more a uh, dramatic uh, phenomena is that you can see that after the neuron uh, firing, the oxygen, uh, oxygenation increase because of uh, increase of blood flow, while the decrease of the deoxyhemoglobin due to the uh, minimal increase in oxygen met metabolism. So you can see that there is a contrast here between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. This is important, why? Because this leads to the discovery of both fMRI. So this, the discovery actually is phenomenal. And this is the MRI imaging where, oh sorry, <laughs> using every day. And how can we get this? Because the oxyhemoglobin, when you in, uh, get into the um, MRI, it wasn't dis disturbed the field, MRI field. While the deoxyhemoglobin will distort the magnetic field and decrease the signal. So if uh, blood flow increases dramatically compared to oxygen hemoglobin, you can see that the oxyhemoglobin concentration is way higher. So you can see that oxygenation can show in the MRI. So this is the fundamental of a formation of MRI imaging. So uh, with this background, uh, the following talk, talk I'll uh, uh, keep coming to the PET imaging and fMRI. So here is just a little bit background of the imaging. Uh, okay, so I'm pretty blessed, uh, blessed uh, uh, to be able to work with Dal Fox for the past seven years under his training to learn all these uh, cool imaging techniques. And I'm also blessed to uh, be able to work with a, a group of, uh, bar, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button, a group of uh, well-known uh, scientists in Barsha in, uh, Institute. 
So with them, I can reversely translate the uh, neural imaging from human studies into animal models. So in a previous talk, we know about restrictions. So I would, in a later part of this talk, I will tell you how we can use neural imaging to study brain function and the color restriction in animal models. And there is an anti-aging drug, <laughs> rapamycin. It's also well known from Barshaw Institute. And I also show you some studies showing how rapamycin can uh, pre restore the uh, vascular function in Alzheimer's disease. OK, so this is the background <laughs> of myself and the study we're doing here. OK, so come to the topic about aging. So we know that aging can be obviously observed from appearance, right? We are, you can easily tell who is younger and who is older. So from outside, we can see from appearance. And also, we know um, that one of the major uh, function loss is memory loss. And this is from outside. We can know from a patient. But the question is that how can we know from inside what's going on in the brain? So about the brain, so here it is. That's why uh, neural imaging come to very uh, powerful here. Because from the imaging, we don't need to open up the head, and we can see the brain. <laughs> and you can see clearly that outside appearance is here, and inside is like this here. So young adults, you can see there are a lot of folding here, and brain tissue is um, a lot more compared to the healthy aging adults. You can see they lose more. Uh, uh, brain uh, tissue and also the ventricle is larger. And this is normal aging. And how about in Alzheimer's disease for people who has neurodegenerative disorders? You can see the, uh, the, the, decree, uh, the loss of the brain tissue is more dramatic compared to the normal aging. So people doing neuroimaging, is hopefully we can monitor the changes um, in brain over time and can early uh, diagnose the risk for uh, neurodegenerative disorders. So we can come in uh, with intervention early on. So this is the goal of neuroimaging. Okay, so come to outline. I'd like to give you three, uh, three different uh, topics today. And first of all, I'd like to show the imaging uh, so far, the imaging study showing how, what's going on in normal aging brain and what's the difference between normal aging and neurodegenerative disorders, and mainly is Alzheimer's disease. And the second part I'd like to share with you is that how can we early diagnose the uh, risk factors for neurodegenerative disorders and how can we do about that? What's the intervention? What's the treatment efficacy uh, with that? And how neuroimaging play roles in these three parts? So the third part, I'll talk about intervention related to color restriction and rapamycin. Actually, after Steve's talk, I don't know what I should talk about color restriction here. <laughs> Anyways, I would just stick on whatever I have, and please uh, let me know if you don't agree anything. OK, so I'll come to the summary. And hopefully, after this talk, we can answer these two questions, or you can have your own answers for these two questions. Is, that, is there any effective way to monitor changes in the brain with age and early diagnose risk for uh, neurodegenerative disorders? Or is there any effective intervention or treatment that can retard brain aging and uh, neurodegenerative disorders? And hopefully after this talk, you can have some answers for that. Okay, so the first part, I'd like to talk about uh, how neuroimaging tell us about brain aging and the, uh, the changes in neurodegenerative disorders. So for this uh, whole part of talk, when I refer to neuroimaging, actually these three are interchangeable. So for magnetic resonance imaging, is MRI, it can do anatomical um, measurement, and it also can do physiological, like blood flow measurement, and it can do functional activity. I can show some pictures on that. And post-situation emission tomography is mainly on physiology, and here the talk is mainly focused on glucose metabolism. And third one is magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It is also mainly focused on uh, metabolism. Okay. So this is the first uh, slide. You can see that with age, this is a gray, uh, gray matter uh, volume. So the brain com ma mainly consists two parts. One is gray matter, and the other one is white matter. So you can see that with age, gray matter decreases with age. And this is mainly in the frontal lobe. So frontal lobe and pr uh, temporal lobe, they are highly associated with Alzheimer's um, symptoms or pathology. So you can see that this volume decreases with age. 
But why matter is very interesting is uh, by phase, uh, two phase. One is increase during developmental uh, phase and then decrease uh, during age. So with this combined together, you can see that before 50, 50, uh, 55 years old, usually the brain, overall brain volume doesn't change that much because this is going down, but where this is going up. But after this, after 55, especially 60 plus onward, you can see that there's a change, there's a decline in overall brain volume. And this change, actually, you can see this image. This shows the decre uh, reduction between, uh, compared to old uh, elderly, elderly subjects, individuals compared to young subjects. And you can see that this is normal aging. So every year, the annual reduction rate is 1% uh, after 65 years old. And so you can see, and mainly it's occurred in the frontal lobe and the, uh, a little bit uh, in the pyro uh, and also in the parietal pyro lobe. And these two areas are very important for uh, modulating cognitive functions like memory and um, high, uh, high uh, level of cognitive function. So this is in normal aging, you can see uh, reduction rate is 1% per year. And not only in structure changes, uh, gram, uh, matter vol uh, volume loss, Another a recent study, they correlate with a glucose metabolism. So you can see that uh, with PET F FDG, you can see there is a very high overlap between gray metal volume loss and the reduction in FDG uh, glucose metabolism, especially you can see again, it's in the frontal lobe and the prior, uh, prior lobe and a little bit in the temporal lobe. And those regions are susceptible to uh, um, AD pathology. And the changes is also 1% per year. So it's very similar. So you can see that with normal aging, uh, brain volume changes and the functional changes, they're going in hand in hand. And also this is a blood flow because we know that metabolism and flow, they are tightly associated with one another. And decrease in blood flow is also shown as a high risk for Alzheimer's disease or of dementia. So there's a vascular dementia. So you can see that between young, middle age, and old group, there's also a decline, and the uh, reduction rate is, again, is 1% per year. And you can see that in subcortical areas, there's more susceptible uh, to reduction in blood flow, while in the subcortical area, it's remained pretty well with age. So aging is not, um, aging is um, affecting uh, the structural and physiological changes is, uh, is there's a variation, it's not globally. So that's why we're, uh, because Alzheimer's disease and dementia is highly associated with uh, cortical areas. So we are really focused on how we can uh, detect the change and early on knowing um, how this can lead, uh, lead to neurodegenerative disorder later in life. Okay, so, that, so for that part, uh, the previous part is just give you a static uh, information about blood flow and uh, metabolism changes. And metabolism changes tell us a deeper level is that probably mitochondria in the brain it also be, uh, has dysfunction. So there's a new technology coming up with carbon-13 MRS. <laughs> so <laughs> it's still running, okay. So with this uh, techniques, we can go deeper level. We can do uh, uh, invest uh, to look into neuron and astrocyte interaction, so we can see deeper. And with these techniques, uh, actually, this uh, developed in Yale University, and I went up to Yale uh, for the last two summers to learn about these techniques. And it's very interesting is that you can use these techniques. Okay, so with the carbon-13 level glucose going into uh, infusion with the intravenous line, it can go into the TCA cycle. And in between this TCA cycle, there is an intermediate called alpha-guta rate. Uh, it will exchange to become glutamate. And we know glutamate is a neuron transmitter. And this neuron transmitter can go into neuron and back to astrocyte, and again, back into neuron. So this is a re recycle, glutamate and glutamine recycling. So in this, two, uh, in this model, we can measure two things. One is uh, the TCA cycle rate. So we know how much glucose is oxidized and generate ATP. And the other thing is that we also can measure glutamine, glutamate, recycle, uh, the transmission. So we, we know neuron transmission rate. 
And also with uh, carbon-13 acetate injection, we also can measure the TCA cycle flux in astrocyte. So this techniques is, uh, the beauty of this techniques is it can tell us what's going on in the neuron and in the astrocyte. So with this techniques and Yale group, they do a very interesting study in normal aging people. They found that not only in the previous, we know that glucose reduction is reduced in normal aging, but we don't know whether it's from neuron or from astrocyte. And this study tell, give us the answer showing that actually the metabolism is dramatically dropped down in neuron. It's 28% drop down in uh, TCA cycle and also the neuron transmission flux. But very interesting is that the glial metabolism increase. So in normal aging, there's a shift uh, in brain metabolism. Neuron is a main, uh, reduced while glial increase. And why this is important? Because the increase in glial uh, metabolism can cause uh, inflammation, oxidative stress. And next study giving us a similar answer is that they measure uh, with uh, P31, um, phosphor 31 MRS. It can tell us not only the ATP production rate, but also give us a redox state, which is NAA, uh, NAD and ADH, the ratio. And this one, they modulate the TCA cycle. So the ratio changes can also change the TCA cycle flux and also change the ATP production. So with these techniques, this is also newly developed uh, techniques and showing that actually with age, the redox state also changes. And this also indicates the increase in oxidative stress in the brain. And very interesting is that, you know, in a normal healthy brain, the, uh, usually neuron and exercise they love each other and they work pretty well with one another. But when they're getting old, like old couples usually have fight, right? And they're fighting with one another. So if over, if one part of the couple is too strong, sometimes it's not too good, right? So if the glia is overactivated, like the previous two slides shows, then actually neurons get damaged. So one, one of the couple, if couples is too strong and the other one will get damaged. Okay, so that's always my husband told me that if you are too strong in the family, yeah, he got damaged anyways. And <laughs> so, so this, yeah, so neuron got damaged, so that's why he got less uh, metabolism and he got higher metabolism here. And this increase will cause inflammation. You can see that detrimental pro-inflammation response will uh, will, will be brought in, and there will be a uh, cascade and eventually lead to uh, Alzheimer's disease because we know in Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta accumulation, tau uh, accumulation, that's all, all associated with uh, inflammation. Okay, so normal aging, if something goes wrong like this in normal aging, it goes into dementia, Alzheimer's disease. So this study, again, they want to differentiate normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. So you can see in the previous slides, we know that the normal aging changes is about 1% per year. And how about in Alzheimer's disease? You can see it's a four to 5% per year. So the brain loss is more dramatic, especially again, it's in the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. And those areas are highly associated with uh, Alzheimer's pathology. Mainly the, uh, the accumulation of amyloid beta are here, yeah. So this imaging is again, uh, is very powerful to tell us what's differences between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. And with a follow-up study, that's uh, the previous one is just an initial measurement. And with 1.5 years follow-up, you can see uh, they have more than five to 10% uh, decrease, yeah, in their brain, in the uh, patient's brain. So the loss is dramatic. That's why they lose memory uh, pretty fast and have uh, difficulty maintaining their life. So this is only in structure. And how about in blood flow? And blood flow is also a known biomarker for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the cerebral blood flow is uh, associated with the sever uh, severity of Alzheimer's disease. This is normal aging and with uh, the severity of the disease, you can see blood flow drop down accordingly. And so blood flow is also a, well, a very good biomarker for differentiate normal aging and Alzheimer's. 
And again, this is a glucose, again, a glucose metabolism. So in this here, very interesting, it's not, so structure is sometimes it's not so obvious, but with functional or physiological measurement, you can see very clearly uh, with colors that uh, glucose metabolism drops down uh, significantly in Alzheimer's disease patient. Okay, so let's come, and this is Alzheimer's, and how about MCI? MCI is a trans transitional stage between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. And people with uh, um, amnestic uh, uh, MCI were high risk to turn, con um, convert, uh, to uh, become Alzheimer's disease. So what's the uh, difference between MCI and AD? is that the brain volume reduction in MCI is about 2.4% two, two, uh, 2 reduced, while in Alzheimer's disease, is, again, uh, we just mentioned, it's about 4 to 5% decrease. And the glucose metabolism is a very good, uh, it has been shown, a very good um, biomarker can predict the conversion uh, from MCI to AD uh, with an annual rate for 17.2%. It's a two years follow-up, and they come with this big number. So, and so combined with the glucose metabolism and their memory test, there's, they, uh, the investigators show that there's 17 times more likely to convert, uh, convert from MSI to AD than subjects who had normal results on both measures. So now with imaging and other measures, uh, measures we can come up with biomarkers and predictors to early diagnose or predict what's going on in the brain and whether they can convert uh, to a more severe stage. Okay, so the story till now uh, is pretty, uh, so uh, this is a summary for this first part, is that brain volume, glucose metabolism, blood flow decline with age and do so in an accelerated manner in neurodegenerative disorders. And neuroimaging has been able to uh, monitor the changes and diagnose uh, neurodegenerative disorders in vivo. So the story here is kind of uh, a little bit sad, right? If people already gone to that age, uh, gone to that stage, whether you tell them, you find it out with newer imaging, what's the benefit for them? So what can we do about it? Can we do this earlier before they have the onset of this disease? Can we tell they have to, they have to go down the road and we can prevent that? So that's the next part of this talk is that can we early identify the risk factor for neurodegenerative disorders with uh, using neuroimaging. So there's lots of uh, risk factors, and I want to just bring this up because Dr. Uh, Steve Austin also showed this slide that ApoE carriers, they have, uh, this is a ma major genetic factor, uh, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And carriers, if they have two copies of ApoE4 gene, then they have four to eight fold increase at the risk for developing AD compared to non-carriers. And the onset of Alzheimer's disease is reduced by seven to uh, 15 years in a dose-dependent manner compared to the non-carriers. So people are starting to uh, pay, uh, pay attention to on this uh, population. So in, uh, uh, er, uh, in the uh, early study, in showing that compared to uh, normal aging, you can see no more memory ApoE4 carriers, which means they, are, they still have uh, normal functional, functioning memory, but you can see their brain glucose already goes down compared to uh, uh, age match control. Of course, their glucose is still better than the dementia state, uh, stated, uh, status, but you can using a uh, PET to tell, wow, there's a risk factor there. And this is old uh, subjects like uh, 65 plus. And uh, Raymond, they are very interesting. They, do, they bring in young uh, ApoE4 carriers and middle age uh, ApoE4 carriers. And young age is about 20, 30 years old, and middle age is about 40 to 60. And they uh, give them the brain scan, a uh, PET scan, and to their, to their surprise, this light blue showing the reduction of glucose in their brain already. So even in as early as 20 years old, their glucose metabolism already down. And this uh, purple area is the pathology uh, in uh, AD patient. So you can see there is a big overlap between 
uh, the hypometabolism in young patients and the AD patients. So using this, they tell that even though they have intact cognitive function, they have intact brain structure, but their brain metabolism is already down. And so this po possibly can be a tool to early tell or detect the change in their brain metabolism, and maybe this can be a way to prevent uh, work, something in coming in to help them to uh, prevent uh, the, the further decrease of uh, glucose metabolism. And another study, uh, Buchheimer, very interestingly, they do functional MRI, like the one I mentioned. They give them a, a task, like a memory task, then the, the neuron will firing, and you can see how much is uh, oxygenation here or uh, neurons firing in the brain. So, com so you can see the Ap compared to the APOE4 and APOE3. APOE3 are normal uh, uh, populations. Uh, usually they consist of about 78% of the population. Uh, so APOE3, they are normal. And compared to APOE3 subjects, they are doing memory tasks. APOE4 subjects, you can see the uh, signal is higher and also the brain area they use to do this task is also bigger. Why is that? Because their brain the, the one of the uh, explanation is that because their brain metabolism is low. So when they are doing a, func a task, they need, the brain area needs to recruit more helps from other areas. And so they, uh, they can compensate the energy deficit. So they need more energy and they need more help from their surroundings to do the same task. So that's why their brain activity is higher and through the subtraction, you can see that APOE4 are curious. They need more uh, brain energy to do the same task. So this is also to give us a biomarker to tell the risk uh, of uh, uh, hypometabolism in APOE4 carriers. So the, from this study, people are suggesting whether we should just recruit all these uh, people with APOE4 genes and do brain imaging. So would they know they have the risk and they can pay attention to their lifestyle and pay attention to what they do in life so they can reduce or retard the onset of APOE, uh, the, the uh, Alzheimer disease. So this is one of the thinking about using imaging to help early diagnose or uh, detect the risk for uh, Alzheimer disease. And other than that, actually in the literature showing that there are other risk factors like depression or PTSD, a diabetes. Um, this too, depression and PTSD, showing that all in this patient's glucose metabolism also so severely lower compared to the normal uh, control uh, subjects. And also diabetes, you know, in a previous <laughs> study, Steve, showing that these monkeys, uh, they are, have high sugar glucose, right? Uh, high sugar diet, so they are more diabetic. So, Actually, in this same study is that they also do the brain structure measurement. So compared to the uh, CR animals, the control high, high sugar diet animals, they, have, they lose the brain volume more dramatically compared to the CR cohort. And this is the age effect. Of course, age, uh, the brain volume decreases with age. Also with diet, you can see that with color restriction, the brain structure preserve much better compared to the, um, the libitin cohort. And so from this study, again, um, showing that neuroimaging is a very good tool to identify the risk uh, for dementia or uh, risk for neurodegenerative disorders. So, okay, so summary of this part is that we know APOE4 carriers have high risk for Alzheimer's disease, and neuroimaging is able to early detect the alteration of brain glucose metabolism and brain activity uh, with a risk factor for neurodegenerative disorders. In this case, we're using APOE4 um, carriers um, as an example. Okay, so this is the second part uh, of this talk. And this part, I'm more excited about this because this gives us hope, right? If you know about you have the risk for Alzheimer's disease, what, what kind of life would that be, right? So people, why is, uh, so I didn't mention is that why people have the, uh, 
they are hesitate to have their brain imaging done if they have APOE4 care, uh, genes because they don't know what to do. Yeah, and so we're coming to here is that is there any interventions or treatment efficacy uh, we can evaluate it with the newer imaging and give that to uh, the patient or people who have high risk uh, for dementia and maybe uh, can be really helpful to them. And before I give the talk, I want to give you a story about this uh, because I was from Taiwan and we learn Chinese history all the time. So whenever we study this, uh, this uh, emperor, we will listen to this story over and over again. This guy, uh, his name is uh, Qin, Qin Shi Huang, which means he's the first emperor of, um, of China. So he's the first one, and he built the Great Wall, right? He actually, he uh, kind of repaired the Great Wall, and he unified uh, China. And he also did lots of work, like major economic or political reforms. So he's very, uh, uh, he's very powerful and very, uh, uh, he's high, with high achievement. But this, despite all this achievement, he's not that, he was not that satisfied. Because why? He wants to live forever. That's his ultimate goal. He wants to live forever. So he sent people, uh, his crew, all over the world, try to find anti-aging anti uh, anti drugs or any interventions, whether it's herb, uh, herbal or natural medicine, whatever. As long as they can extend his life, he will be happy. And so there's a called the elixir, elixir of life. There's a yeah, the kind of um, uh, magic drug that can uh, extend longevity. But to his dif disappointment, he died at the age of 49. <laughs> so it doesn't expand, extend his lifespan for shorter lifespan. So <laughs> like CR, right? It's not necessary to go to a, a direction we want. Okay, so what's going on is that he probably due to the non-FDA medication because all these magicians give him different drugs to try out different food, different diet to try, and at a, at a time there's no FDA. So he died with a... Uh, drug with mercury inside of it. So that's why it's shortening his lifespan. So I think we're more luckier than him because at the 21st century, we know part of a story that po possibly calorie restriction can extend longevity, but probably Dr. Austin already convinced you that is not always the case. But uh, so in McKay in 1930s, he, uh, in his laboratory subject, right? He found that uh, with different various uh, uh, level of color restriction have different uh, uh, result of like uh, span uh, um, extension. And then, so, and also from uh, Steve's uh, uh, slides, we also know that color restriction have a lot of beneficial effects on health span and can reduce the risk for cancer, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and so, so forth and so on. So in this study, uh, because I am very um, fortunate to get a, a grant uh, funded from NIA, so I just want to know how color restriction can affect brain metabolism and brain health, and can that be detected with neural imaging? So we got a cohort from NIA, and they are young, control, and O control, and O with uh, color restriction uh, um, treatment. And so we found this cohort because they, leave, they, they already shown that live longer under color restriction. And we look into that, their physiology, we found actually why they can live longer, probably because they, they, have, they maintain a pretty health uh, lifestyle, <laughs> a healthy uh, 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 life. So you can see their body weight preserved pretty well with age, and their blood glucose also pre preserved pretty well. And, and you can see the body weight in the, at the libitum group, they increase dramatically uh, with age. So probably they are overweight and possibly diabetic because you can see their blood glucose is higher. So we said, okay, these guys, uh, if they are under color restriction, they are healthy and possibly, and also in other studies showing they have better uh, memory um, uh, performance in, in the uh, behavior task. So we just bring them in and we, again, I went up to Yale University and I did the uh, carbon-13 uh, glucose infusion and to measure their uh, TCA cycle and neuron transmission rate. So very similar to the human study we just seen before is that, is that their neural activity goes down with age. This is a young group, the purple dot showing the young group. 
and the red one showing the old control um, uh, at the libitum group. You can see very similar to humans, their uh, neuronal, neuronal, this is a neuronal, not glial. We didn't measure the glial uh, activity. Uh, so neuronal metabolism goes down dramatically with age, and also their neuron transmission also goes down with age. But with core restriction, those young, healthy guys, you can see their results are very similar to, to the young ones, which means outwardly their body weight, their glucose, very similar to young guys. Also inside their brain, their brain function is very uh, comparable to the young ones. So overall, their, their overall health is just the young guys. So this is very encouraging is that if we uh, live a healthy life, um, actually when we are there, those guys are about 60 to 70 years old compared to human's age. They can, as young as a 30 year old guy. So this is very encouraging. And this is just the quantitative data. You can see that uh, with uh, age, everything drops down, especially in neuro, uh, neuron metabolism and uh, uh, neuron transmission. This is very similar to uh, in humans, but calorie restriction or healthy diet, they can really preserve uh, this kind of decline. And we also do blood flow measurement. So you can see the cor cor we measure the cortex and uh, you can see overall, uh, their blood flow is increased. And we also do uh, regional measurement, cortex and the hippocampus. These two regions are very similar to uh, those regions in human performing high level cognitive function. So with these two areas, we also see globally, they have uh, enhanced uh, blood flow and also regionally, they also have preserved blood flow. So not only their neural activity is preserved, but also their blood flow is preserved. How about glucose metabolism? Here we go. Yeah, it's the same thing. So they have preserved global glucose metabolism and also regional in cortex uh, metabolism. So, so why calorie restriction retards aging is because they really, in this cohort, in this strain, okay, maybe other strain will show different things, but in this strain, they really showing that they have preserved brain function, brain metabolism, brain blood flow. And so that, that's why they have better memory and ev eventually lead to uh, extended longevity. Okay, and how about structure? They also have preserved, you can see their hippocampus. Hippocampus is the uh, area that animal using to do a uh, uh, memory uh, performance. So you can see they also have preserved brain structure. So their physiology and structure in the brain are all preserved. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so all these are color restriction, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so this, uh, I think everybody's tired and hungry, so I will, <laughs> I, will, I will keep this short and interesting. So this is the very last part of the talk, and it's another anti-aging drug, and these two are very famous uh, from Barsha Institute, it's color restriction and rapamycin, so I like to give uh, everybody a heads up about what's going on with the rapamycin. Uh, rapamycin. Rapamycin, uh, the name, you know, mycin is kind of uh, uh, anti-inflammation thing. And rapa, the main name came from here because this was discovered from the Easter Island. And the native language of this island is Rapa Nui. So they came with rapa, this name, so rapamycin. And here's a plaque showing that this, is the, this stuff is discovered there. And this drug actually has been long long-term used in humans, and is an FDA-approved drug because it has been used to uh, suppress the immune function after organ transplantation. So it has been using in humans for a long time, but to, um, to our surprise is in 2009, there's a paper on Nature from Barsha's group. they showing that rapamycin can extend longevity in animal, and both in, uh, this is in mice, and both in female and male mice. And they found, actually, they uh, found more is that there's a, a significant, uh, there's a specific pathway core target of rapamycin. And we inhibit this um, pathway can retard the development or, or the growth of the cell or the organism. And Steve, you can correct me if I say anything wrong. He's an expert on this. Yeah, and also color restriction possibly share a similar pathway 
compared to rapamycin. So that's why these two um, have somewhat similar effects on uh, lifespan. And in, with this, uh, my colleague, uh, Veronica Galvin, she used this drug to treat his animal model with uh, APP transgenic gene inside, so it can mimic uh, Alzheimer's disease in humans. So she treated these animals for four months after they already have memory deficit. And with water mass, a uh, water mass um, uh, uh, test, so what, what does this do is that they train this animal uh, for a few, a few days, and then they put into this opaque water so they can see what's under the water. And so they need to find this hidden platform. So as soon as they find, they, uh, they find it, and the uh, uh, researcher will take him out. So he got rescued. So, and so they need to find, every time they get into the tank, they need to find this platform. And the only thing they can use is the queue around the wall and to find it. So the sooner they can find it, which means they have a met better memory, right? During the training time, they remember where the platform is. So when we're doing the test, they can do it pretty well. So, but they, so she did four groups. One is uh, non-transgenic, just uh, normal control, and, and normal uh, control with rapamycin treatment, and as, uh, Alzheimer's disease control, and Alzheimer's disease mice with rapamycin treatment. So you can see the three groups, actually these three groups have very similar performance. They, they can find the, um, with different days, uh, they can find the platform faster, sooner. But the AD, uh, Alzheimer's disease mouse, they always have difficulty to find a platform. They don't, they, they have memory uh, loss. So this study showing that rapamycin can really uh, rescue their uh, memory or their cognitive function. So she wants to know what's going on in the brain. So we talked together and we, uh, so I just did put his mice into the MRI scanner and we measured the blood flow. So you can see these four groups. Uh, the higher the intensity, the brighter is showing the higher blood flow. So you can see that the transgenic mice has significant lower uh, blood flow, but the other three groups have very similar and higher uh, blood flow you can see here. So there's, there's no significant changes, uh, differences between the three, but the uh, AD mice group has significant reduction in blood flow. So this is very consistent with the cognitive um, outcome, the behavior outcome. How about the global, uh, the regional one? So we also measure their uh, cortex, especially their hippocampus blood flow. You can see that rapamycin really can restore and rescue the uh, vascular deficit. So, and this is structure of the blood vessel. So again, you can see that the uh, transgenic mice without rapamycin treatment, they lose uh, blood vessel branches over time but the rapamycin one, they have uh, preserved blood, vessel uh, blood vessels. And so the further uh, down, we want to know what's going on, what's, what's rapamycin is doing in the brain blood vessel. So we do an inject, uh, acute injection of the uh, uh, rapamycin into the tail vein of the mice, and we see that over time, about 10 minutes after injection, the blood vessel dilate and the effects is very similar to another drug. This ACH drug is a well-known vessel dilator. So we found, wow, rapamycin not only have a um, um, function to doing on um, immunology, but you also have something to do with the vascular function. And we go further down. Uh, with this increase in blood flow, we found that the animals, they have reduced uh, amyloid beta plaques in their brain. And to our surprise is that actually the generation of the amyloid beta in these mice does not, different, does not differ from the, uh, the ones without uh, rapamycin treatment. But why they have less uh, deposition? The hypothesis is that they have an increased blood flow. So the blood flow can increase the uh, clearance of the amyloid beta deposition in the brain. And not only in the brain, but also along the blood vessel. So uh, the... Uh, a major pathology in Alzheimer's disease is that their brain, uh, brain blood vessel also have uh, all the surroundings with amyloid beta plaques. But with rapamycin treatment, you can see the plaque is dramatically decreased. So we found, well, um, increase in blood flow definitely has beneficial effects to preserve um, brain function in animals modeling Alzheimer's disease. 
So this is the uh, uh, way we found is that rapamycin can inhibit mTOR pathway. And mTOR pathway can, uh, if without inhibition, it will inhibit the uh, nitric oxide, noxide, um, uh, activity and this one is a vessel dilator. So with rapamycin treatment, the vessel dilator uh, factor increase and so it increase blood flow and thus increase the clearance of amyloid beta accumulation. Uh, the, uh, so the clearance rate is higher, so the uh, deposition is lower and thus can restore their memory and their brain function. And the following is that uh, we are trying uh, the uh, job project we are doing right now is looking into APOE4 carriers in a mouse model. So we hope if rapamycin can really can restore the vascular function, we hypothesize that it also will have restored the vascular deficit in APOE4 um, mouse, APOE4 carriers. If this could be successful, there will be uh, trans directly translation to human studies because uh, this drug is FDA approved, right? Not like the Qin Shi Huang. He, he used a non-FDA um, approved drug. And neural imaging can definitely uh, seamlessly translate from animal model to humans. So we hope this can be successful and then we can apply the clinical trials or studies on human subjects. So even though they know they have a risk for Alzheimer's, they also have hope. They also have way to uh, retard uh, the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so the summary of this part is the co-restriction uh, in our study showing that they can preserve brain metabolism and blood flow with age, and rapamycin can restore vascular function both globally and regionally, and also enhance uh, cognitive function in the uh, Alzheimer's disease transgenic mouse. Uh, neuroimaging is able to effectively evaluate co-restriction and rapamycin efficacy in animal models. Okay, so uh, I want to emphasize is the the beauty of the neural imaging is that it can do both way. If we find something in humans, we can bring it back to animals. And if we find something in animals, we can bring it back to humans. And those are the techniques I mentioned today in the presentation. And we also have others, many other um, ways to measure brain activity or brain function, like diffusion tensor in, uh, intensity or fMRI, resting state connectivity. I didn't put things in, into this talk because, yeah, there's too, too much to be covered. But I would love to share with you in the future um, with more data on that. Okay, so the summary of this presentation is three parts. Right? The first part, we're using neuroimaging to uh, monitor or identify the differences between normal aging and neurodegenerative disorders. So neuroimaging is able to do that and neuroimaging is able to, in some aspect, to early diagnose the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And neuroimaging can be used to evaluate intervention and treatment efficacy in, uh, for retarding brain aging and Alzheimer's disease. And so, the, I like to put this is that maybe neuroimaging may have profound applications in transl translational research in brain aging. Okay, so those two questions. So if after this talk, I don't know whether you have the answers, but for myself, the first one is yes, we have a way to effectively to monitor the changes in the brain with age and also uh, detect the alteration in the risk. So this is a yes. And this one, we need more <laughs> evalu uh, yeah, investigation and evaluation. Yeah, like uh, Steve said, there's different genetics background uh, can have different response to color restriction. So my next step probably take different strengths of animals different, with different uh, genetic background and to do the um, uh, evaluation on that with the neural imaging. Okay, so for this guy, what we should do with him? So he, he, he looks like a little bit overweight. So if he was here today, he probably want to try color restriction or maybe take rapamycin in the future. And also definitely uh, he want to monitor his brain health with brain scans. Um, so with all this, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, in UT Health Science Center and the collaborators in Yale University and a funding source and their support made all this uh, possible. And most of all, thank you for your attention. Questions? How do we, as an average person, 
get that test to see at what stage our brain is at. How, Excuse me, how can we ask our doctor or is there an institute that we can go to to have our oh. brain tested? Yeah. And see at what stage <laughs> we're at. Yeah, so uh, maybe Dala Fox is here. Yeah, he can help answer this question. He's an MD and I'm a PhD. I'm mainly focused on research. So what we usually do with uh, patients or people who are interested in this is that we have study going on like rapamycin or any study going on um, to measure like depression study. We have a PTSD study going on as well. So we will po post the flyers out and anybody who is interested in participate and who is qualified, we will recruit them uh, to come in to have a brain scan and we will evaluate uh, the efficacy or the treatment effects. But the, the thing is that there wasn't no the result because this is a research. So for clinical aspect, um, I think MDs can maybe, maybe. Uh, yes, certainly you can get uh, glucose metabolism. Uh, sorry. You can definitely get uh, brain glucose metabolism scan perform, uh, scans performed. That's FDA approved. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was just recently FDA approved a um, little over a year ago is measuring amyloid deposition in the brain mm -hmm. with imaging. That's not currently available in San Antonio, uh, but it is available. And so people that are at risk um, or concerned about that can get amyloid scans performed. So they can ask their um, uh, doctors and doctors can mm -hmm. provide a prescription yeah. and they come in to have They'll have to travel to do it so far. Oh but, yeah, they have yeah. to travel, yeah. They offering that. Travel where? where? Uh, I think research aim is. Do we? Uh, we don't of, offer uh, clinical uh, scans, right? But in hospitals, they do. Uh, the amyloid beta scans would be the most relevant scans. Glucose metabolism can be measured. Um, there are many facilities in San yeah, Antonio that can be done in San Antonio. Do, yeah. Uh, PET brain imaging. The amyloid beta imaging, I think the nearest place that you could get that would be uh, in Houston. Houston, yeah. okay. Do you see sometime in the near future there being some type of screening? And uh, uh, when I say near future, what, how soon would that be? Uh, you say in the future? Yeah, well, some type of screening that would oh, screening. be. Oh, screening. Yes, to uh, actually be able to identify whether. You know, I mean, right now we have so much for uh, breast cancer and yeah. prostate cancer. Is there, with Alzheimer, uh, so many diagnoses being uh, brought up? You know, is that something that uh, I know there's a lot of research right now being done? But how how soon will we have some? I mean, right now it from the end today provided for her, it seems like you have to either travel far, and I know PET scans are very expensive, mm -hmm. so that's something mm -hmm. that they're not gonna offer to everybody unless you can yeah. afford something like that. Yeah. So I don't know whether the insurance is one of the issues, whether in insurance cover the imaging costs, because it, this is really expensive, yeah. Yeah, like MRI is about $1,000 per hour scan. Yeah, so maybe the policy is one of the issues. And from research perspective, I would love to know what's the uh, interaction between gene, genetic factors, diet, and exercise, and other factors. And we hope, my, my long-term goal is have a personalized uh, uh, intervention, because not color restriction can apply to everybody, exercise. So what we want to do is using, right now at research stage, is using imaging to find out different biomarkers and identify what can be used to uh, differentiate normal aging and Alzheimer's. And as soon as we find it out, we can apply that, maybe apply that to human to understand more. And be beyond that, I don't know how, they, how soon they can really bring into public to be available to everybody, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to underscore that a little bit. Um, the current standard for testing the efficacy of drugs or uh, other treatments like caloric restriction is to do a clinical trial. And as we heard from Dr. Alstad, that can take years 
to do those trials, and they're really extremely expensive. Uh, so right now, there are no proven therapies for Alzheimer's disease. We have, or you know, just neurodegenerative changes with age. We have some very interesting suggestions and possibilities. One of the reasons that we're pushing hard on imaging techniques and the translational to and fro between animal studies and humans is if the imaging studies can show effects quickly, um, which they can, can we test candidate therapies early, and if they're not working, stop, and if they are working, then move on to a clinical trial. So the imaging um, I'd really look at as uh, before a clinical trial to motivate uh, the desirability of doing a clinical trial, and so to really accelerate the, uh, the research process and bring the cost down, um, so filter through these possible treatments with imaging. And I think going from the animal work, mm -hmm. so now the obvious next step is to do some of these imaging studies in humans, and if we see similar effects, then move on to try yeah. uh, clinical trials. Yeah, thank you. One more question, one more question. Anybody? Yes. Time, for, time for lunch. Enjoy the lunch, forget about forestry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.